It's shocking, but true. The Romans' road evangelism sales pitch is satanic. And the reason for this is that it uses as its foundational, fundamental starting principle a concept that's being roundly and vehemently rejected in the passages following. Unfortunately, the book of Romans is not read as the argument that it is. And doctrines are formed from the side of the argument that's being presented in order to reject it. And it's a complicated book to sort through which side is which in some points. It's not always clear where the transitions are made. Some places it's very obvious that the voice has changed from the one side of the argument to the other. But to have an absurd illustration, the way that the book of Romans goes is to present two sides of an argument. And so, if, for example, one side of the argument were to say that Jesus was a man, and the other side of the argument that I make, and that I advocate, and that I'm presenting, is that Jesus is made of wood. Well, you could take from what I present here, and you could extract the audio clips of the portion saying Jesus was a man, and you could say, look, these clips are saying Jesus is a man. The argument being made is that Jesus is a man, but no, my argument is that Jesus is made of wood. And so you can misrepresent the quotes that are presenting the other side of the argument. And I say, Jesus is the door, and doors are made of wood. And you say, no, Jesus was a drunk and a glutton. And you can't be a drunk and a glutton if you're made of wood. And I say, he could not possibly have been a drunk and a glutton. That was an accusation that was leveled against him. The fact is that he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Therefore, he's made of wood. And you say, but he ate and drank. So therefore, he was a man and he had wounds. And Thomas put his hands in those wounds. Therefore, he was made of flesh and was human like us. And I say, but he was hung on a tree. And what hangs on a tree but a branch? And he said that he was the branch. So therefore, he was made of wood. And the other side of the argument could state that those who say he did not come in the flesh is Antichrist. And I could say, but he's made of wood. And the evidence is that he said, take and drink. This is my blood. And his blood was made of grapes because he has grapes growing out of him because he's the vine and the branch and he's made of wood. Now this is obviously stupid and absurd, but it's illustrating a point that I'm presenting two different sides at the same time. And there's a transition between one side and the other. So you can make the case that Jesus was a man, and you can make the case that Jesus was a tree, or a grapevine, or a branch, or whatever, a door made of wood. And you could take one side of that argument and present it and make a doctrine out of it, but it would be the side of the argument that I'm not actually advocating, because here in this stupid argument that I'm making, I'm advocating that Jesus is made of wood, which is why he grows grapes out of himself, which is why his blood is made of wine, and why he was hung on a tree, because he's a branch, and he's a door, therefore made of wood. So you could take the parts where I was advocating the opposite position, and you could present them as though that's my position, and no, that's incorrect. My position is that he's made of wood. So we're doing the same thing in the book of Romans, where two sides of an argument are being presented. And it's even worse, because in my illustration it was obvious that there's two sides of an argument, and it's obvious where the transitions are. 
But in Romans, there's not necessarily that obvious transition. And one of the reasons for this is because what it does is it takes a, it uses a technique where whatever the position being refuted is, you adopt that position and follow it through logically and are basically using a, a way, an argument technique of saying, here's what you believe. Here's what happens. Here's where it takes us if we follow it to its logical conclusion. So if you're logical about it and you're consistent about what you believe, then this is what we would conclude based on this whole body of evidence that's been presented about what you believe. So this is what's happening very much in Romans. The other thing that it does is it uses ridicule and sarcasm, which if you miss that as well, you can end up getting the opposite out of it than what's really being said. I showed this in the one that I did on the epistles being theatrical, where I talked about the sarcasm in Romans 7 of what shall we say then is the law of sin? And the answer is yes. Although the words used say the opposite. So when you read it from the flat reading where you get your doctrine out of it, and this is not this is not an argument between two sides, this is not a persuasive argument, then you end up saying, is the law of sin? And the answer by words, by text, is no, it's not. But when you actually take in what's being said, you see that this is sarcasm because it says that sin abounds from the law. And when you understand that, you realize you can't have sin abound from a good tree. And therefore, yes, in fact, the tree is bad because the fruit of it's bad. So there was sarcasm there in Romans 7. When it says, is the law sin? The answer is actually yes even though the words themselves say the opposite, because it's sarcasm. So that's another technique that gets used that's completely missed in Romans. So when we go to it, it's not always clear exactly where things... A lot of times it takes a very gradual following the progression. Here's the logic. Here's, here's the position that's being presented. Here's the conclusion that you would draw if you actually have that position and then here's the whole part that flushes that down the toilet so it can be i i myself have looked over this over and over again and sometimes i don't know in certain sections necessarily what i'm looking at but to a large extent it is clear that a position is presented and then it is rejected. And an unfortunately large amount of evangelicalism has derived its doctrines from the positions that are presented in order to knock them down. So let's take a look at that. And we'll just kind of blast through here, starting right at Romans 1, even though Romans Road doesn't actually start at Romans 1. So first we'll just go through, it's got this whole bit that ends up getting taken as though it's about homosexuality, what it actually has to do with violence and divisiveness, and it's got nothing whatsoever to do that. Um, so here in verse 23, 22, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So this is talking about the position that's about to be rejected. So first though, is going to set up the position that's being rejected. So the position being rejected is people who, professing themselves to be wise, became fools. And they changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. The Creator is blessed forever. Amen. Here we see in verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. So what does this mean? Well, it doesn't mean wood carvings. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean stone statues. That's not what it's talking about about worshiping the creature. It's talking about the fact that they have an image or you could say a notion of God that is corrupt. It's not an uncorruptible God 
that they're worshiping. It's a vengeful, dissatisfied, hateful, divisive, corrupt, sadistic, retributive God. And that's what they're worshiping. That's the idol. That's the false, corrupt image that's being worshipped. And then they're worshipping their creation. What is their creation? Religious works. Traditions of men. Religious works rather than helping out people. That, for example, memorizing a passage of scripture rather than helping somebody. Submitting your tithes to the temple rather than submitting alms to the needy. So when you elevate the religious works above actually helping the needy, you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping your religious creation. You're worshiping the religion that you participate in rather than the God who made everything. So now we get to this part that is treated as though it's about homosexual sex. And it's got nothing to do whatsoever with sex. It's got everything to do with violence. It says, The men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. And since Puritanism has told us that sex is wrong and that lust always has to do with sex, we think that this says they burned in their sexual desire one towards another. And it's not their sexual desire, it's their lust. This is talking about anger. Because they're burning. They're hot-headed. They are fuming, rageful, vengeful, wrathful, angry toward one another. Men with men. Well, there you go. That's homosexual. No, it's talking about the clashing of men with men. The combat. Working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat, which is the violence that's unleashed on you. When you're in a fight, both parties suffer injury. You're going to receive in yourself what you're dishing out. So let's go to verse 29. It says, well, well first, actually verse 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Not convenient. In what way is butt sex something that you would describe as not convenient? That makes no sense whatsoever. That's not the way that you would word that if that's what you were talking about. You would word it in a completely different way. But what's not convenient? It's not convenient to be divisive between one another. It's not convenient to be not cooperating with each other. It's not convenient to be in disunity. That would make sense. Now look at this list of 23 different things. And if I even concede that fornication is sexual, which I don't, but let's just concede that one, there are still 22 items on this list that are about violence and division. And one that would be about sex, but it's not. Because it's actually another... When it says covenant breakers, that's what fornication is. Fornication has got nothing to do with sex. Neither does adultery. Uh, this whole Puritanism background that evangelicalism draws from has got this notion of sex being wrong and everything becomes sexual because it's got this fixation on it. That anything having to do with any sex organ or sex act or any attraction of one toward another is therefore disgusting, putrid, wrong, degrading, and it's got a very unhealthy view of these things, and it imposes those on what these words mean, and that that is imposing something that's not there in the text. Fornication is about covenant. Adultery is about covenant. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with sex. But here, let's take this list, 23 items long, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. This is about violence, not butt sex. Okay? So now we get to this 
part here. This is very important. These people being talked about, this is the case being presented, is going to present their side of the argument. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever that you judge those for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you that judge does the same things. Is you that judge having butt sex? Is that what that's talking about? Or is that talking about violence and divisiveness? Is that talking about being unmerciful and despiteful and proud? Is that talking about being an untrustworthy backbiter? Is that talking about being hateful? Are you judging other people for those aspects, but you're doing the same? What's being talked about here? It's got nothing to do with sex. So as we continue, the argument was presented. Here's a position. And then the conclusion was, if this is what you believe, then you're, you're without excuse. The argument was presented, hey, they're without excuse. Well, then you're without excuse. Let's be consistent here. Do you actually believe what you claim to believe? This isn't a doctrine to draw from. This is an argument being made saying, here's what you believe. Here's the logical conclusion. Why do you disagree with the logical conclusion of what you believe? Now, I believe verse 2, then, is an objection to everything that's been presented up to verse 1. And it says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And then it gets back to the re retaliation. And you think this, O oh man, that judges them which do such things and does the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? If you've got an idea of a judging God, why are you not under that judgment? That's what it's saying. You've got this person objecting and saying, But the judgment of God! The, but the, uh, uh, uh. And the response goes, well, then you're under it too. Okay, wait, wait. So you are here for this judgment of God, but you think you're exempt from it. How's that work? So then it continues and it says, let's get to verse five, because this is, this is where it really starts to hammer down. It says, after the hardness and impenitent heart, after the hardness and impenitent heart that you have, you treasure up unto yourself wrath, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous, quote, righteous judgment of God. Okay, this is not agreeing with this position. This is attacking this position. So, it's saying, the kind of person who relishes the thought of a day of wrath and righteous judgment of God has a hard and impenitent heart. That's the kind of person that thinks, oh man, these unrighteous people are going to get it. Is a hard and impenitent heart that treasures wrath. So here's what you treasure. Here's what the position being attacked treasures. A hard and impenitent heart treasures wrath and righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. Well, doesn't that sound like every religion? Do good and get good. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. And this is a transitional moment. But let's back up. So a hard and impenitent heart treasures wrath. A hard and impenitent heart treasures a God who will render to every man according to his deeds. A hard and impenitent heart treasures a God who heaps wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil to the Jew first and also of the Gentile. A hard and impenitent heart treasures that. A hard and impenitent heart treasures glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there's no respect of persons with God. 
this is a position that's being attacked. It's being laid out there to be attacked. Now here's a transitional moment that it's really going to say, here's the way you see things and I'm about to destroy it. So now it says, For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Well, that's completely false. This is utterly falsified and rejected a little bit further on. But this is the position being presented in order to reject it. The position being presented is that the doers of the law shall be justified. Now it continues presenting this position that is opposing. This is the position that's about to be opposed. This is the opposition opinion. When the Gentiles which do not have the law do by the natures of the things contained within the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, you are called a Jew and rests in the law and make your boast. Wait, wasn't that word boasting on that list of 23 things? I think it was. The, the, the part that's supposedly about anal sex. And know his will and approve the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. And you're, you are confident that you yourself are a guide of the blind and a light to them which are in darkness. But you're not. You are confident that you are an instructor of the foolish. You are confident that you are a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. You think you've got it right. And therefore, what you teach others, you teach, don't, don't you teach yourself? I mean, you teach that a man should not steal. Do you steal? You say that a man should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you commit sacrilege? You that make your boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. You, Mr. Religious Man, are the cause of why people hate God. That's what it just concluded. You're the reason that people, people hate God. You're the reason that people think God's not good. For circumcision verily profits if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? I think he's starting to flip things over here. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, you, 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 did, the, you did the snip the tip, but you're not really doing the parts that matter. Uh, how about the guy that didn't snip the tip, but he's actually doing the shit that you're supposed to fucking do? What do you think about that? Hmm? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you? Shall not the, the, the reprobate uncircumcision, who does the things that fulfill the law, is it not his right to judge you, who by the letter and circumcision transgress the law? You're not keeping the law that you, up, that you claim that you, you live by. You're not keeping the thing that you call a law of God. You're not doing it, and he is. Doesn't he have the right to judge you? You're sitting there in judgment against him. Oh, what a reprobate. He's a non-believer. Oh, you know, he didn't do this or that, whatever. He, he didn't snip the tip, or he doesn't rest on the Sabbath, whatever it is. Doesn't take Saturday off. Oh, horrors. But he's actually doing the things like helping the needy. Isn't not his right to judge you, religious man? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Notice it doesn't say he is not a Jew which is one biologically. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. 
But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So it's saying there's something about a person that makes them a Jew. But it's not something outward, it's something inward. Never at any point does it say it's something biological. That might hurt to think about for many people. So what advantage then has the Jew? What profit is there of snip the tip? Unfortunately, we now get to some sarcasm. Well, I think it's fortunate, but it gets misread. What profit is there of circumcision? So this is the, this is the other side interjecting again. Very briefly, what advantage then has it to be a Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? Oh, much in every way, sure, yeah. Chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So let's just skip down here. We get to verse 9 of Romans 3. What then, are we better than they? Hmm. Didn't it just say there's much in every way that you're better? Oh, right, because it was sarcasm. Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Now, this is the, the position being presented in order to destroy it. By no means does the author think that all are under sin. The author is taking this position in order to follow it through. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. This is what the law says. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all going out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. This is not something to form a doctrine out of. This is the side being presented in order to take it down. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. This all has to do with violence, by the way. None of it has to do with butt sex. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Here it is, verse 19 concludes that the purpose of the law is to make people guilty. Therefore, remember when it said something about the doer of the law is justified? Well, here it is. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, because the only thing the law does is make you guilty. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Is that a good thing? Is that good fruit coming from that tree? The knowledge of sin, accusation, being told you're guilty is what the law does. This came to a crescendo where it concluded that the law says you suck. And that's the only thing it does. Now, Romans Road Evangelism starts here and says, well, look at here, Romans, Romans chapter 3 says you suck and God needs you to agree with that. No, God does not need you to agree with that. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It's going to conclude and wrap up this position of being on the law side. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but it's actually inverting this idea. It's not all have broken the law and come short of the glory of God. It's all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because they have not counted themselves to be the glory of God. So it just inverted the definition of sin from transgression of the law to a failure to realize that you are the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness 
that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Here's boasting mentioned again. It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. So here we have the word law again, but it's in reference to faith. So here you have that the idea of all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which Romans Road evangelism satanically starts with saying, you suck and you need to uh, agree with God that you suck because then he can pull the wool over his own eyes and pretend that you look like Jesus, who he loves enough only to have murdered rather than tortured forever and ever. But instead it jumps into saying you're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus justified freely. There's no works involved to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. It doesn't say to offer his righteousness for the remissions of sins to declare it, to declare, I say at his time, his righteousness Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. Because God is not an unrighteous deity that's going to judge people by the hard and impenitent kind of heart that men judge people by. Because he's a justifier, not an accuser. So where is boasting? It doesn't matter that you think you got your doctrine ducks right. You think you got all your little doctrine ducks in a row and you had it right and God's going to reward you for, for how right you got it. But where is boasting then is excluded because there is no law of works. No, it's a law of faith. Therefore, we conclude. So everything that's leading up to this is is leading up to this. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without deeds of the law. Why doesn't Romans Road evangelism start with a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law? Why does it start with saying you suck, God hates you? No, that's what the law said. This whole entire passage has just taken the law, said here's what the law says, but it's all bullshit. It's the law of faith. So there's going to be a little clever line here that that goes with this law of Moses versus law of faith. Is he a God of the Jews only meaning the believers only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes. Of the Gentiles also. So not only of those who outwardly declare themselves to be Jews, but those who inwardly follow their conscience. Seeing it as one God, not two, not one, not one in his nemesis competing against each other. Not one in his nemesis who's more actually better at being God than God is. Just one God. It is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Hmm. One God will justify both the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Do we then make the big void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Okay, not we establish the law of Moses. We establish, we do make void the law, the law of Moses, but we establish the law of faith. So you see here, this is setting up a position and then knocking it down. Now it continues through chapter four to go on and set and show how works aren't what get you righteous works aren't what make you whatever religious definition of righteousness is that you've got all your your doctrinal creeds according to our denomination and you've got all your facts straight and therefore god's going to say what a good job you've done in this life getting all your doctrine ducks in a row and knowing all your facts correctly let me reward you because you actually had 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 it all together. You were you were the one that really had it down pat. Good job. Everybody else they they got it completely wrong. They completely screwed the pooch on this one. 
But you, you had it right. That's the day of judgment. Right. Sure. So, it says that Abraham wasn't justified by works. Abraham had his faith counted for righteousness. And God imputed righteousness without works in verse 6. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Guess who that is? Everybody. Don't say that too loud. Then you won't have a reason to go out and throw this hard sales pitch on people telling them how much they suck and telling them that they had better get their doctrinal facts straight and confess according to the creed of your denomination. Does this blessing then come upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Ooh, he hadn't snipped the tip yet. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though he be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Interesting. And the father of circumcision to them that are not of the circumcision only, but also who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. For they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. Wasn't there something back there about do we void the law? No, we establish it. Yeah, remember how it was it was kind of making a play on words to say the you know to to flip the idea on its head. Well, here's the acknowledgement that that's exactly what it was doing. Faith is made void in the promise of none effect because the law works wrath. There we go again. What does the law do? Nothing good whatsoever under any circumstances. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but also that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Not the father of the believers, not the father of the people who got the right creed to confess, the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations to him who believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, for he was about a hundred years old, and neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God." and being fully persuaded that what he was promised, he was able to also perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, the, our Lord from the dead. Who do we believe on? Him that raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead. Let's read that one again. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Chapter 5 really starts to hit hard. Therefore, ooh, we're concluding something. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now contrast this with what the law says, where you only have a priest who gets to stand before God. This is saying that you get to stand before God. You get to stand before God. I get to stand before God, not just the priest. Because we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. So we'll get to... 
Here we go. For yet when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Here's how people act. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, not one we got our doctrine ducks right, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified, being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. From what wrath? Does it say it's God's wrath that we're going to be saved from? No. Back there, the, the position being rejected was a guy whose hard and impenitent heart rejoiced and treasured the thought of a wrathful God. But th that's who we're saved from wrath from is from people. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled by God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So if you need to get from point A, where you're the guy thinking that you need to keep the law, to point B, which is, no, this is, this is something that's a done deal for you. It's a gift from God that's been given to you. Your entire image of what kind of God God is, is wrong. Your entire concept that the religious establishment had everything right. If you believe that, all are damned because of Adam. Well, then you need to follow the logic through as well and say, death passed upon all men for all have sinned until the law of sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Another dig at that. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Why did it only reign from Adam to Moses? Moses was when the law was established. Even over them that had not sinned. Death reigned over them that had not sinned. Huh. That's an interesting phrase. Death reigned from Adam to Moses over them that had not sinned. Wait, wait, let's back up here again. Because sin is not imputed when there is no law. Wait, there, there's no such thing as sin unless there's a law? It's almost like it's saying there's no such thing as sin unless there's a law. Hmm. Don't think on that too hard. The similar to... Uh, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also as the free gift. For if, it, if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. Much more? Wait, so if everybody was under Adam, then everybody and then some is under Jesus Christ. I think that's what I'm getting from this. And not as it was by the one that sinned, so as the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life, not after you're dead, by one Jesus Christ. Where do you reign? In life. Not reign in afterlife not reign in post-mortem life. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Well, I'm looking for the part that says, but only... Only if you, hmm, I'm not, I'm not seeing the stipulation that says how you get to be made righteous. It, it almost looks like the stipulation is that Jesus did something that did something and worked. Huh. Well, that's a little bug in your bonnet of making hard sales pitches of telling people how much they suck. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound? What? Well, it's almost like the law is the problem. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound? 
that as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign un- through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So, you can see here that this has got an argument that's presented. And then it's just demolished. It's just absolutely annihilated. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, yeah, of course. Let's do that. That sounds like a good idea. No, that's stupid. Come on. How shall we that are dead to sin... Oh, wait, wait. There is no such thing, right? Because there's no law? <laughs> know ye not that as many were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore... Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. Wait a minute. It's it's saying that whatever happened to Jesus happened to us. Ooh. There goes another one of them bugs in the bonnet of that hard sales pitch and telling people how much they suck. It's almost like you could just go and find out if they need anything. If they if they if they need any kind of help. Maybe they just need somebody to talk to or something maybe you could do that instead of telling them that they suck and they need to agree with your church's doctrine I don't even like that word church your denominations doctrine because we're all the church the ecclesia which interestingly in Spanish they actually call it the ecclesia iglesia the ecclesia. They didn't, they didn't change the word into something else like we did in English. I think that was because the English had to make a point of rejecting the Roman Catholic. And therefore, they had the king that had to be the head of the church. So they had to have a different word than calling it the ecclesia. So that you could distance yourself from that whole idea. Oh, I'm getting loopy. (laughs) Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we all should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. What's that mean? We should not serve the law. For he is that is dead is freed from sin, meaning freed from the law. How do I know this? Well, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Not sexual desire, but anger, fear, division. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. As those that are alive. Why? Because everything that happened to Jesus happened to you. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. It's almost like there's a tie between sin and the law. Like they can't be separated from one another. And like when you get rid of one, you get rid of the other. Interesting. When reading the book of Romans, it's a good idea to be careful about forming doctrines out of it. Because what's being said might be sarcasm. Or it might be something that's being set up in order to knock it down. Rather than engage in Romans Road hard sales pitch evangelism that starts with the satanic perspective that you suck 
And God wants you to agree how much you suck. Perhaps we could actually share the gospel, which is to help those in need, to give sight to the blind, to help the lame to walk, to heal the brokenhearted,